Hi, everyone. Thank you. And I'm very honored uh, to be introducing this next section. So let me just ask you, how many people in this room uh, were alive the day that President Kennedy was shot? Actually, a lot more, more than I expected. If you weren't born yet, how many of you saw the pictures, watched Walter Cronkite make the announcement to the nation about what had happened? Of course, uh, everyone. Um, at that moment, something died in, in the spirit and soul of our country. And what we're going to talk about in the next half hour is a fascinating slice of what was going on at that moment in time in 1963. So let me introduce our next two speakers. Uh, we're going to hear from two women in the next half hour. The first is Ellen Fitzpatrick. So Ellen is a professor at University of New Hampshire. Uh, she's a scholar specializing in modern American political and intellectual history. and. She is the author and editor of seven books, including the New York Times best-selling Letters to Jackie, Condolences from a Grieving Nation. And joining her is Christy Scott Cashman. Uh, Christy is the founder of St. Air Productions and is passionate about storytelling in all of its forms. So in addition to producing films, uh, Christy has become extremely involved in the literary world, inspired by this art of organic storytelling. Uh, one of her notable projects is the Open Book Club, which was born while hosting renowned authors and special guests affiliated with Penn New England. And she's also the producer for TLC's feature on Letters to Jackie. So let, please join me in welcoming Ellen Fitzpatrick and Christy Scott Cashman. Thank you, Diane, and thank you to the Ad Club for inviting me. This is not, uh, you're a group of people that I rarely run into. My only connection to business and entrepreneurship is through my wonderful brother-in-law, who was a partner in Ernst & Young, who's recently retired and has been the uh, devoted uh, husband of my sister, uh, who has been ill, and I was reminded as I was looking at your program that although we're very familiar with the idea that there is often a great woman behind a great man, there are some pretty exceptional men behind some wonderful women, too. So we've been very lucky to have Jeff Wright, my brother-in-law, helping all of us out, and I wanted to make that point before I begin. I had the great privilege of uh, stumbling across a collection of letters uh, purely by accident as I was engaged in another research project uh, at the Kennedy Library some years ago. I was a fellow that year at the Radcliffe Institute and had the great luxury that we academics have of taking a year off to do my own research and writing. And uh, in the course of that year, I had decided that I wanted to write a book that looked back uh, to the early 1960s, a period of great idealism in some ways in our, our, our country, a period that I remembered very well, and uh, to peel back some of the layers of American political history of what had happened since those years. It now has been, as Diane mentioned, 50 years since the death of John F. Kennedy, which was certainly one of the more shocking events of my early life. The great impact on our family reacted very powerfully to it, as did most Americans who were alive in 1963. And my thinking was that there had been so much written about President Kennedy since his death much of it not very complimentary. We've learned a great deal more about him as a person, more about his administration. And I thought that it would be useful to go back to that earlier moment when the country in many ways was much younger uh, than it is today. K 
Kennedy was our first television president, and those of you in media and advertising will appreciate the fact that he had all of the upsides and none of the downsides of mass media coverage. That is, he was perfectly suited to the medium of television. He was handsome, he was young, he was articulate, he had a beautiful wife, he had two adorable children. And yet, he uh, was not covered in the way that modern political figures are today. There, he made uh, masterful use of press conferences, but he didn't have the 24-hour cable news cycle, which meant that in the evening, there would be many hours of television commentary pretty much undoing whatever he did have to say earlier in the day and explaining why it was completely wrong from every point on the ideological spectrum. Uh, in addition to that, he had a less aggressive press, so uh, issues about his health, issues about his private life were largely unknown to the American people. And what was known was a public image that was extraordinarily appealing to many Americans in that period. So all of this was in my head as I went down to the Kennedy Library one day, thinking about this book that I hoped to write. And as I was driving down the Southeast Expressway, I began thinking about what shall I look at first? The Kennedy Library is an extraordinary repository of material. There are literally millions of documents there. And for a historian like myself, and for all of us, in fact, you need a beginning point, you need a starting point in a big project like this. And it suddenly popped into my head. I really had one of those eureka moments when I remembered Jacqueline Kennedy coming on television about seven weeks after her husband's death and thanking the public for the condolence letters that she had been receiving. At that point, seven weeks after her husband's death, she had received 800,000 letters of condolence. And then over the next year and a half, that number climbed to about 1.5 million letters. And it occurred to me that perhaps as Americans, and in fact people around the world, sat down to write their thoughts to Jacqueline Kennedy in these condolence letters, that they might have reflected on President Kennedy, on the state of the country, on how they saw the social and political events of that time. And so I decided to start there. And I went into the library, and I asked the archivist if I could see these letters. And uh, he said, um, you know, do you, I said, do you have any of these letters? And he said, we have some. Unfortunately, when the Kennedy Library was being established, the feeling was that these letters would take up too much space. So they hired a team of archivists. They culled the collection. And of the letters from Americans, they kept about 15,000. So it felt a little bit, the staff at the archives is wonderful, and I don't mean to cast any aspersions, but it felt a little bit like when you're a little kid and you go in the library and you want to take your first book out of the library, and the librarian looks at you sort of suspiciously like, well, maybe. And uh, so I said, so do you have any of the letters? And he said, well, we have some. And I said, could I see some? So um, he said, sure, and I filled out the form. And the first box, archive box, came. And I opened up the box, and I took out the first file folder. And the first letter I read was from a family of Eskimos who lived in Alaska and who really could see Russia from their house, <laughs> and who said that they felt safer with John F. Kennedy in the White House. And then I turned the page, and I began to read the most extraordinary letters that in my entire career as a historian I had ever seen. It's, it was a historian's dream in a sense that here was a moment of historical cataclysm when the entire country was really torn apart and people had sat down and poured out their heart and soul in these letters to Jacqueline Kennedy. And many people talked about losses in their own personal lives, as one does in a condolence letter. But there was what I had hoped to find, 
very profound, uh, compassionate, and incredibly perceptive comments about our country. And I've described it, this is I think the best way I can describe it, I felt as I opened the archive box that I was looking at the beating heart of America in this moment of great turmoil and trauma. And I began reading these letters and I instantly decided that they should come to light and that I should forget the previous book and try to do that. And I went back to the Radcliffe Institute and I had these copies of these letters and I was flagging down the other fellows. I think when they saw me coming with these yellow copy sheets, people began running in the other direction eventually because I would say, oh, you just have to hear this one more. And I was just astonished by the diversity of the voices. There were people who were illiterate, uh, who could barely take pencil to paper, the stationery upon which they were written. There were people who had saved up money to buy a stamp and who had walked for miles to post it. It was rare for them to have ever written a letter. Um, and then there were letters from blue blood Republicans, you know, on heavy embossed stationery with Park Avenue uh, return addresses. So it was an a, a amazing cross-section of the country. Uh, the most difficult part of this project was that I learned that under US copyright law, the copyright for a personal letter resides with the letter writer or his or her next of kin for 90 years. And so in order to publish these letters, I needed to find the letter writers or their nearest relative to get permission. And that was an entirely different journey that I set down but a fascinating one in which I got to see what had happened to these folks over the ensuing 50 years. Uh, it was a great project. I learned a tremendous amount about our country. Uh, it was deeply revealing. It, it was totally compelling. I read all 15,000 letters, and I picked 300 that I th thought were worthy of publication. The story of this project became a national news story and uh, that, of course, was wonderful for the book, but it was also wonderful because I shortly thereafter got an email from a documentary filmmaker named Bill Couturier, who told, whose name I recognized. He had done an Emmy Award-winning film called Dear America about letters that soldiers had written home after the Vietnam War, and I had greatly admired the film. And he wrote a note and said, I have read about your book and I think it could be a film and I'd like to talk to you. And uh, so I said, sure. He came to Boston, we met, and uh, it took three years and uh, we had wonderful help from Christy Cashman, who's here with me today, and we're able to put this film together. Uh, we're gonna show you a little clip of the film. I don't know if I've used up my time. Is it a good timing? So we'd like to show you a little bit of the film. Um, and uh, it features one letter, but I think it will give you a very nice sense, both of the material that I was working with and what this extraordinary filmmaker was able to do with it. Dear Mrs. Kennedy, 
I am but a humble postman, and I realize the many letters you have received, which is by deserving to you throughout this wide world. We at our house have continued to mourn the great loss to all of us. We are, my wife and I, and our four children. Our youngest boy is also three as yours. Your husband and I were both of the same age. I too having been born in 1917. We both were in the South Pacific area during the last war. But I was no hero as for him. We both married in 1953, and my wife is the same age as you are. I am not ashamed to say how terrible we all felt at this tragedy. So our heart goes out to you and your very dear children for always. Please try to find in your heart that we Texans of Mexican descent had a great love for all of you. We do hope that you will not think all of us Texans bad. There is bad in every sort of people. May God bless all of you. Yours most sincerely, Henry Gonzalez. That was so beautiful. So beautiful. And so, Alan, I want to start by just asking you, I mean, first of all, we're all very glad and privileged that that guy let you take a look at those letters. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just, Thank you. I'm wondering, I mean, you know, I, I look at that and I go, oh, okay, I know why <laughs> she put that one in. How, you read, you read 15,000 letters, how did you call through everything and figure out what was going to be in the book and then eventually in the movie? A lot of it was really instinctual. When I saw this letter that began, I am but a humble postman, Right there, I knew I wanted to publish that letter. What was so wonderful about so many of these letters were how eloquent, as Henry Gonzalez was, these so-called ordinary Americans were, and um, how self-effacing they were. The most common phrase that I read in these letters was, I am a nobody from nowhere. That's how people introduced themselves to Jacqueline Kennedy. And they went on to, uh, I think it was, um, to answer your question, the eloquence of so-called ordinary people that drew me to the letters. And so some of the letters, as you would expect, uh, were simply letters that said, I'm terribly sorry about what happened. It was a great tragedy for the nation. But many more were like this. Mm -hmm. And so I divided them very early into sort of three categories. There were people who talked about the events of November 22nd, there were people who had seen the Kennedys literally a minute or two before President Kennedy was murdered and who spoke about being on the parade route. So that was one whole category of letters. And then there were a second 
set of letters in which people really talked about society and politics, about the state of the nation. And there were a third group of letters in which people talked about their own experiences with grief and loss, as one does in a condolence letter. And they told their life stories. And those were very moving letters. So the, the categories emerged the first day that I began reading the first box. Um, and uh, then it was a matter of looking for a kind of representation of the character of the overall collection. Right. And Christy, what drew you to the project? Uh, Bill had sent me a rough draft of, um, of the film, and a uh, rough version, I should say. And it was, um, it was pretty obvious to me that it was a very special project. And as a filmmaker, as a creative person, um, I think I'm always looking for something special or an original story uh, or a story that's been out there told from a different lens. And this, I felt, was definitely that. Um, it was also a time when uh, letter writing was sort of a theme in my life because my mother, who died when I was 17, had um, uh, written hundreds of letters home while she, um, when she went away to university and then had 10 children. And it was interesting when my uncle showed up very near when Bill sent me the, um, uh, the film with a duffel bag full of these letters. And uh, it was sort of like meeting another version of my mother. And um, just as the film shows where the letter writing, the art of letter writing is sort of, um, well, it's gone or going, um, it's sort of a celebration of the art of, of letter writing. And um, another, you know, from another, Way, uh, another way to appreciate the film is the, is the art of letter writing. And my mother was interesting in that when she first started writing the letters home, they were perfect on perfect stationery and beautifully written and all that. And then the more children she had, they were sort of scrawled on the back of homework paper and, and paper that had, been, had water damage, coffee stains. And so the letters themselves told a story. And so um, that was definitely something that was, that was uh, in my life at the time, and therefore kind of something going on other than just, is this an interesting project, but almost like other voices in my ear saying, this is a project worthwhile. Yeah, and do you have, well, I'll ask both of you, uh, other than what we just saw, do you have a letter or a message that just stands out in your mind from everything that you've seen and read? Uh, for me, it was um, um, a little girl named Janice Hirsch. How old was she when she wrote that? I think 13. 13. And a uh, little girl with big balls who wrote a letter. <laughs> she had polio, and she wrote a letter to um, Jackie, and it was just, it just stood out. As, it was funny. It was poignant. It was heartfelt. And... Um, it was just so beautiful. And actually, Janice is a very successful writer herself and lives in California and um, has worked on some great television shows and is a great person. Hmm. So. Yeah, and what about for you, Alan? There, it, it's sort of, I'm often asked this question. It's sort of like picking one of your children as your favorite. Yeah. I just can't do it. Um, I loved every letter that I picked to be in the book. Uh, one letter that was very moving was a letter from a woman whose husband had died in the thresher, a submarine that had sunk off the coast of Cape Cod. Some of you may remember this event. And she wrote a letter to Mrs. Kennedy in which she quoted the letter that she had received from President Kennedy when her husband had died. And so she was reading back his words. Um, in which he said, it's a sad fact of history that um, so many men, of the best men of every generation, lose their, give up their lives for their country. And she said, Mrs. Kennedy, this truly is your husband. And she went on to say um, that you know, when you feel very much alone, um, remember us, the wives the thresher left behind, our hands reach out 
for yours. Oh, um, you know, the other thing that's striking just in looking at the film is, and I do remember this, is um, the people who lived in Texas. The whole thing, there was, there was something uh, around the 50th anniversary of the assassination where there are people in Dallas who still feel guilty, who still feel that there's something that their city could have done, and you see that in the film um, with him writing, you know, not all people in Texas are bad. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you had a lot of that. There was, there was actually a, a larger sense of guilt even outside of Texas from people in the United States. And it was a tumultuous period in our history. And of course, a very pivotal moment in the civil rights movement. Kennedy had introduced civil rights legislation in June of 63. And uh, the civil rights campaign, of course, was, was uh, greatly underway. And there had been a great deal of violence uh, Medgar Evers had been murdered the night that President Kennedy gave his great civil rights speech. And so that sense of guilt that somehow a climate of violence had contributed to it was a sentiment that was expressed often in the letters. There were, a one, one woman wrote and said, we have wasted a great man. Uh, history will write its own verdict on blood-stained pages. And uh, I think a prescient remark on her part. Yeah. And on that topic, are, are there lessons? There are obviously lessons by reading the book and reading the letters we can take away about the world and America in 1963. Did you, what observations do you have about women 50 years ago? I mean, this is the, the, the idol, this iconic woman who's getting all of these letters. Many, I think, of, of the letters were written by women. What can we learn from reading the letters about how far we've come or not come? I think a, a couple of things. Um, one is that Jacqueline Kennedy, of course, had been, uh, as you say, a kind of iconic figure. She had been involved in the um, redecoration of the White House. She's very interested in historic preservation. She had been an emblem for fashion and good taste. and. Um, was greatly admired for all of these qualities. But in the end, what these letters expressed were a tremendous degree of admiration for her dignity and courage, in which she went through this public funeral. The people forget, or, you know, or, or maybe don't put these two things together, that she was about maybe three inches from her husband when he was murdered and could have easily died herself. And many of the letters said, you know, thank God we still have you. There was a very poignant letter um, from a Republican in which she said, you know, I didn't vote for your husband. I didn't like him very much, um, <laughs> but I really admire you. And uh, she talked about the moment of the early 60s and the pride that people had felt in this young, vivacious couple and this articulate president. And she ended it very simply by saying, the country will miss you. And um, I found that very, very moving. The bigger takeaway message is that the founders of our country in our great democratic experiment in America put political power in the hands of so-called common people, of ordinary people, because that's where they believed wisdom and virtue resided. And you can't help but feel in reading these letters um, how powerful uh, a reality that really is. We sometimes forget it and we're divided by all sorts of things. Um, but in the end, the, the incredible decency of the American people and the way in which they extended themselves to this young widow and her two children in this moment was, uh, and of course many of the letter writers were women, uh, was a very, uh, I felt, uplifting part of a project. If you have to read 15,000 condolence letters, <laughs> and may you never have to, um, it, that was a, it was truly a privilege to be able to read these letters and to, to be able to come away from it as a historian with a kind of having that message revivified. You know, even listening to you and, and what you've brought to us here, you know, I think all of us 
in this room have had the experience of having to write a condolence letter. And whether we're writing it or whether we're sitting at our computer screen about to write an email or whatever, there's that moment when you just say, I don't know what I'm going to say. And yet here, you have ordinary people saying such profound things. How has this affected the way you write your letters, and especially how you write your condolence letters? It's made my handwriting much neater. <laughs> Just, you never know. <laughs> you never know whether it's going to end up in one of your films, right? Yeah. yeah. I would say, um, first of all, um, the takeaway message that I got was, write the letter. Write the letter. Uh, don't send an email. Write a letter. And um, I think that, you know, as you, I, I think we often pause as we write these letters and you think about your, your concern, and unfortunately I feel like I'm, I'm confronted with this problem more often as I get older, uh, that you really, uh, it's not a moment to, to sort of hold back, but to speak from your heart, which these folks did. And they have left an incredible record for all of us as a result. And how do we see the film? That's complicated. <laughs> um, Bill Couturier, uh, the filmmaker, had trouble uh, getting anyone interested in making this film. But eventually, um, the Discovery Channel uh, did uh, put up the money for the film. And uh, in my view, lamentably assigned it to a TLC to, as the uh, subdivision that would broadcast it. They have shown it exactly once. Um, however, we were able, thanks to Christy, to have a limited theatrical distribution of the film. I would like to see the film get out there, um, but that's going to involve um, some new financing to, to get the rights uh, for uh, making a DVD and so forth. So I hope that happens. So if anybody wants to write a Anyone check. Anyone has a check that to How give us. How much do we need? <laughs> I think 250. 250 and that's no. not 250 dollars. <laughs> <laughs> would do it. But uh, it's it's really uh, you know a lot of times authors have films make out, made out of their books. They're not very happy about it. I think it only improved the book, and mm. it was really a pleasure to work with Christy and and with Bill on this project. Yeah, well, thank you for doing this work. And Christy, there's something you said that I think is so true, which is um, it does, it, it's inspiring to me to feel that I, I, wanna, I wanna leave the room and go home and write a letter to somebody and, and tell them what they mean to me or tell them how I'm feeling about something. And I hope that many of you are feeling the same way. So thank you for giving us this gift and uh, for doing such a great project. Thank you.